right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. So as I like to do whenever I have a superintendent, um, I have a book to recommend from the church library. Now, if any of you are devotional people, devotional book readers, this is one by Mark Finley. It's called Solitude. Yeah, I... Definitely, if you're into devotional books, this is definitely a must-read on your, your list. And it's still the January. You can catch up. I stole it from the library. I'll stick it back in there when I'm done. <clears throat> but it is worth checking out. His illustrations are really good. Um, makes everything interesting in the morning. So what I want to do today is focus a bit on the hymns in the hymnal. And uh, I've done some of this before, so we might be a little bit familiar. But what we're going to do is we're going to sing a verse, and then we're going to try and see if we can identify the scriptures that are each in the verse. Because what we have in the hymnal is a wonderful collection of Christian poetry that is there to help us think things through and to really understand and learn about our Savior, about Christian doctrine, and wonderful things. So we're going to be singing about the second coming this morning. And we'll be starting with 204. But I'll have a quick prayer, and we'll get started. And then we will be turning to 204 and singing that together as a congregation. And uh, I'll start with prayer now. So Heavenly Father, we're glad that we can come together this morning. And as we spend a little bit of time singing and thinking about uh, your word, we ask that you be with us. And we say this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you'll turn with me, again, we're going to be starting off in 204. And again, uh, what we'll be doing is we'll sing through a verse as sort of like a congregational choir. And then I'll be asking you, uh, as we sort of go line by line, if any of the words trigger, oh, that reminds me of this scripture. Uh, and then just shout it out. And if you don't remember the exact verse or reference, if you just give me an idea, I, that's, that's good enough. I don't want to quiz you guys too hard this morning. So let's start with verse 1. So starting off with the first line there in the first stanza, come thou long expected Jesus. Does that make you think of any particular scriptures? I'll take anything. Let's think about this as Sabbath school, okay? <laughs> John 14, 1 3. I go to prepare a place for you. Definitely. Anyone else? You can still come, Lord Jesus, definitely. Anyone else? Unto us a child is born. Unto us a child is born. Definitely. You know, I was thinking of uh, a couple of the people that were waiting for Jesus, you know, when he was in the temple and his parents took him in there for the first time. You had Simeon and then, um, oh, shucks, the other lady whose name I can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah, okay, thank you. All right, Bible people here in the congregation. So Simeon and Luke, uh, too, says, you know, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So, I mean, obviously we have prophecies that made people wait for him a much longer period of time. But Simeon was like, look, I know I get to see him before I die. And of course we have, you know, Daniel 9 and the time prophecies. And even all the way back to Genesis 3.15, right? We're going to have someone who's going to come and crush the serpent's heel. But So let's go on down and start looking in some of the other lines. From our fears and sins release us. Does that remind you of any particular thing? Anything that comes to mind? In Hebrews, it talks about when Jesus died um, and that he earned the right to destroy the devil and to fear yeah. and to deliver us from our fear of death. Definitely. Uh, 
us. Pastor Bill is, is showing with us a little bit from Hebrews chapter 2, and I'll read 14 and 15 for us. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he likewise himself shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and here we go, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So one of the things that Jesus came to free us from is fear, fear of death. We have hope. Romans 5, 8, what's that? God commends his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Absolutely, come to save us from our sins. So let's see. Uh, looking at the, the next line here, Israel's strength and, and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art. Does anything come to mind there? Philippians <coughs> 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, one of these lines here, this consolation, kind of you know, triggered something in my mind. I'm like, I know that I've heard that in Scripture somewhere before. And it goes back to Simeon. Or, uh, let's see here. Yes. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. So it's interesting, you know, as we're singing through these hymns, even just like there's a word in there, or just a little phrase that are kind of like triggering us to think about different scriptures here and there. So we're not just singing to make music, but these, these songs are there to just sort of like trigger memories in us the more we read scripture and the more we're familiar with it, it's like, okay, I know what he's referencing with that. It's sort of like, it's not pop culture references, it's like scripture references, they're deep, they're good. So, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. And again, there's a, there's a verse down there in, uh, in Haggai that talks about uh, the desire of all nations in, in chapter two. I will shake all nations and they shall come to the desire of all nations and I will fill this temple with glory. And obviously that's the inspiration for one of the great biographies of Jesus' life, the desire of all nations, the desire of ages, right? So let's sing the second verse here, and uh, we'll get into the second verse. to deliver. Born a child and yet a king. Are there any passages that that triggers? Born a child and yet a king? Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Absolutely. I mean, when I think of that, you know, instantly I'm like, the hallelujah chorus, right? <laughs> Definitely. And uh, uh, we have a performance here in Dayton by the, I think the Dayton Philharmonic, right? They do it every year. They used to do it, I think, at one of the Episcopal churches downtown, and this year they did it at the Performing Arts Center. And not all of it is exciting. It's all good. But when you get to the Hallelujah Chorus, it just gives me the tingles, man, I tell you. <laughs> Feel it. <clears throat> um, let's see. From a born to reign in us forever, thy gracious kingdom bring. By thy own eternal spirit. Are there any of these words that's triggering any, any passages here? Again, there's a, there's, a, there's a phrase in here that's pulled directly from a scripture, so it might be a spur, I'll share. Again, this is Sabbath school. It's okay to speak up and get some wrong answers. So one of the things that set up to me in Hebrews 9, verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So again, eternal spirits, pulling these words straight from scripture here. And then by thy all-sufficient merit, raise us to thy glorious throne. Are there any verses there that make you think of anything? All-sufficient merit. <laughs> I think there's a lot of, a lot of Romans that talks to, 
talks to that idea. So it just <laughs> the book of Romans. Something that stood out to me, again, in Hebrews uh, 9, 12. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having attained eternal redemption. So by his merit, his, good, his own perfect life and good works, he ministers to us on our behalf in the, in the heavenly sanctuary. So let's go to our second song this morning. And we're going to be one of the, going to one of the classics, one of my favorites, which is, I guess, the privilege of being able to be up here. We're going to sing 448, Oh, When Shall I See Jesus? 448. I see Jesus and reign with him above. Are there any scriptures that that triggers in your mind? 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 17, the Lord's return. Definitely. 1 First, First Thessalonians 4, absolutely. I mean, this is definitely one of the main passages that this, is, uh, this particular song is founded on. I guess what would be a, a parallel passage that this hymn would be built on? The trumpet, trumpet sounding... Us being changed. Any more clues? <laughs> Behold, I see the book before Second Corinthians. First Corinthians 15. Uh, first Corinthians 15. There <laughs> we go. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But uh, reign with him above. So this, this takes me to Revelation. Uh, and I think of Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. And it's speaking of the saints, right? When we, you know, sort of get past the, uh, you know, when we're when, after the second coming, Let's see, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, you know, so it's taking us to Revelation a little bit in this song. We're kind of going around the New Testament a little bit. And let's see, from the flowing fountain, drink everlasting life. Does that make you think of any particular thing? From the flowing fountain? Living water. Living water. That's right, Christ is living water. Book of John. This is, um, I remember... Growing up, my mom made us memorize some verses out of, out of Revelation. I saw, I'm not going to get this right, by the way, but I saw a clear river of water, clear as crystal, flowing out of the throne of God, or something like that, you know, approximately. <laughs> and I think we get to come to that place where that, that found, that never-ending, clear pool, uh, river, all the good things that we get to see in the book of Revelation. I see some pages turning. Do we have any other ideas floating out around there? Shout it out here, you close. Scott. Like the woman at the well. The woman at the well. Living water. Living water. Found the living water, definitely. John, did you have something? I was thinking of Ezekiel. It's the same as what Revelation has. Okay, Ezekiel. Same as what Revelation has, definitely. Okay. And then, when I hear the trumpet sound in that morning, right? So we had, like we said, we have 1 uh, Thessalonians 4 mentions, and I'll read 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Amen. So let's go ahead and sing our second verse now. here we got a layup <laughs> the first line of the second verse 
Someone help me out here. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. Yeah, Ephesians 6. The gospel, the gospel armor. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Definitely. And then, uh, when the combat's ended, is there anything that that triggers for you all there? I fought the good fight. There's laid up for yeah, a reward in that. Absolutely. Revelation 21 4, wiping away every tear. Revelation 21 4, wiping away every tear. Definitely. Lots of good things to look forward to. One that stood out to me here, uh, 1 Timothy 6 12, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. All right, let's sing verse 3 now. shall hear with transport the host of heaven sing, and then our tongue shall chant the glories of our immortal king. Does anything come to mind here? First Thessalonians 4. 16 and 17. 16 and 17, absolutely. And then, Stephen? Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Revelation Revelation 14. They sang a new song before the throne. They sang a new song before the throne. The song of Moses and the Lamb. The song of Moses and the Lamb. Definitely. And uh, something that comes to me uh, is something that I think we'll all get up there and say. I, I'm also in Revelation, Revelation chapter 5. I think there's some words that we will all learn and all share ourselves. But 11 through 13, and I'll just read a little bit, just a little longer passage here. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature was in, which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. It's going to be a good day when we can be there sharing those sentiments, definitely. Anyone else? All right, so we've got a little bit of time. We will jump to our third song here and maybe do... Uh, uh, maybe one or two verses and then just sing the rest here. So we're going to 598. Watch ye saints, 598. some of the things that we're seeing here in the first verse? Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Definitely. Stars are falling and shaking, absolutely. Anything else that's standing out here in the first verse? Watch and pray. 
Watch and pray. Keep your lamps all trimmed and burning. Again, parable of the, of the ten virgins being ready for, for Jesus coming. Kind of uh, ready for your Lord's returning. Lots of little things here. So we're starting to see things. Like, this song is especially good with making the scriptural allusions really stand out. So let's sing the second verse now. Oh, the promise of Standing out here from this second verse. Well, Acts chapter one. Acts chapter one. one. Where the angels tell him, "Why are you looking up for us? Mm. Jesus. Why are you looking up for Jesus?" Definitely. Now, something that stands out to me so far as the blood-washed robes uh, takes me to Revelation when it's talking about Jesus. Let's see here: blood-washed robes and clowns of glory. Revelation nineteen thirteen. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Definitely. So let's sing the... Isaiah. Isaiah? This is our God. We have waited for him, and he has saved us. This, this is, is our God. God. We have waited for him, and he has saved us. And it says, Tell redemption story. That would be Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Hasten tell the redemption story. So go ye therefore and tell all nations from Isaiah. All right. Let's sing. Let's just go ahead and sing three, four, and five. Let's sing the rest of this song. Kingdoms and nations are coming, part is sharing, wills are rumbling. Tell of hell, grace abounding, part of sin and darkness suffering. Glory comes, oh Jesus comes. Glory comes, he comes on. through three and four and five, it triggered some things and some scriptures as we were singing through. So there's a lot of, lot of food for thought that we have here in the, in the hymns. You know, they're not just songs that we sing because they're pretty, but there's a lot of interesting depth to them. And they're a good devotional tool, too, if you're looking for something that's maybe out of the normal pace of, of what you're doing. So I'll pray, and then we'll transition to our normal Sabbath school. So Father, uh, we're grateful for the work that you've done, and we're looking forward to your second coming. And we ask that you would help us all to be ready for that and to, to look for it and to prepare for it. And be with us then as we transition to Sabbath school and we learn things new and old. And we say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we have several different Sabbath school classes. Again, we have the 
Sabbath school class here in the sanctuary. We have one over here just on the other side of the glass. We have one down here in the library, uh, one down here on the right of the hallway, and Pastor Robot's office and young adults are down the hall in the fellowship room, plus the others. All right, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. That's alive. We have a really great treat this morning. I uh, discovered that a friend of uh, the family's, uh, Dr. Angel Rodriguez, had moved into the community. And uh, knowing the background of Dr. Rodriguez, it seemed fairly obvious to me that for a Sabbath school study on offerings, I should defer to uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Angel Rodriguez. So, Dr. Re Rodriguez, would you come forward? We have a handout for you as well. And Dr. Rodriguez is going to take over our uh, lesson study on offerings. And uh, I just want to tell you what a privilege it is, Dr. Rodriguez, to have you here with our little church family Amen. and uh, sharing what God has uh, obviously uh, given you over the years of your study and research on both offerings, ties, and also the storehouse in specific. So thank you. Happy Sabbath to you. Happy Sabbath. Come on, come on. Happy Sabbath. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. I like that. Now I have, uh, let me put this on if you allow me. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you something. And I want you to tell me what it is. Are you ready? Come on, tell me. Yes. This is a class, so you have to talk to me. <laughs> Are you ready? Yes. What is this? A $10 bill. Now, this bill is mine. <laughs> Was yours. No, it's still mine. You give me back my money. Sorry. Listen carefully. I'm not going to share with you. I'm very selfish. I need it for gas money. I'm sorry, Dr. Rodriguez. It's mine. You want me to take it from you? If you think you no, can. No, 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 I can't. I can't. <laughs> Pastor, I need your help here. Please. We want, I want my money back. So right. you talk to him. All right, John. What is this all about? Man, it's a free $10 you know that money isn't yours. Hand it over. Submit to your pastor. Come on. <laughs> right. Thank you. Now it's mine. <laughs> no. Selfishness defines fallen human nature. Am I right? Yes, ma'am. Without the spirit, this is who we are, selfish people. That's why it is extremely important for us to look at the theology of offerings. The theology of offerings. Now, theology is the study of the nature of God, who he is, and the nature of his relationship with us. Are you following me? Yes, sir. So, we're going to look at offerings, trying to figure out what offerings say about God and what offerings say about our relationship and his relationship with us. Is that clear? So I'm going to tell you a few things 
about the nature of God from the perspective of offerings. And then I'm going to discuss with you a relationship with God from the perspective of the offerings. Is that clear? You see, when I ask you something, you have to answer me. Okay? This is a class. You have to repeat. Okay? So, what can we say about God? When you look at the Bible and what the Bible says about offerings, what can we say about God? Many things. Many things. But I'm going to say only three. Three of them, so that you can remember them. And after I finish mentioning the three, I'm going to ask you to repeat them back to me. Is that clear? It's a class. Okay? So here we go. The first one. Very simple. When I read about offerings in the Bible, I realize that God speaks. But you know that, don't you? Everybody in here, here knows that God speaks. But when, when I read about offerings, I realize God speaks. Very simple. But it's not that simple. Do you know that some specialists believe that the most fundamental characteristic of a human being is language? There is a whole theory about the nature of language as that which separates us from the rest of creation. Language. We talk to each other. I use the language, I talk to you, and then you use the language and you talk back to me. Hmm? And there is God. We don't know the divine language, do we? I don't know what language the, 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 the three members of the Trinity Use, I, I don't know, but I know this. When he created Adam and Eve, he created language. Amen. He gave them the ability to talk, to speak to each other. And you know what he did? He decided to speak the same language to them, using the same language. He used created language to speak to Adam and Eve. It's, it's, very, it's, it's very powerful if we had time. The divine mind used something that he created to communicate with humans. And he uses that language, he talks to me, and then he gives me the freedom to use the same language to talk back to him. So from the divine, from, from the perspective of offerings, what does that mean? It means that God speaks to us in two ways. When he speaks to us, he speaks out a promise. I will bless you. This is the divine word. Speaking, I will bless you. This is foundational for offerings and tithe. That God bless you. So this is the divine utterance. And then the second one is a command. Now the first one was a promise. You remember it? And the second one is a command. Bring me an offering. God speaks with a promise and a command. Without the promise, there would not be a command because we would not have anything to give. So the promise precedes the command. The second thing that, I, that an offering says about God is 
that he owns everything. He created everything and is his. Have you seen the pictures taken by what is the name? James, James Webb Telescope? Have you seen that? It's unbelievable. I mean, we knew that this universe was huge. Now we say, this is scientists are struggling trying to understand what is out there. And offerings are telling me all of that was created by God. It belongs to him. Everything belongs to him. It's a wonderful thought. In fact, it is comforting to know that everything there is in the cosmos was the result of the activity of one person. No gods. One God. Everything belongs to him. And that's why David in 1 Chronicles 29, 14 said, for all things come from you. There's one source. Everything comes from you. And from what we receive from your hand, we give back to you. Condescension. Con divine condescen condescen condescension. Divine humility. So, the first one, the first thing that we said about uh, what offerings say about God was he speaks. The second, he commands. He is creator and owner. Remember those. And the third one is, he is the greatest philanthropi philanthropist in the universe, philanthropist in the universe. The greatest, the most generous being in the universe is God. Because all he do, listen, is give. This is, this is his nature. He gives. Think for a moment. What is he giving us right now? Right now. Air. Life. Life. Oxygen and life. Did you pay for that? Hmm? Did he come to you and say to you, listen, you pay me or you are going to run out of oxygen? Come on, money. It's free. And he does that to the just and unjust. Yes, I was going there. Yes. He, he gives to everybody, the good, the bad, and the, the worst. And, and we can make a long list of things that God is constantly given to his creation. That's why we say God is love. He's constantly given to his creation. Now, this question is for you. What was his greatest gift of all? Now, now, his son, Jesus, Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, 
He gave himself to us. Are you listening? He gave himself to us. Because the gift cannot be separated from the giver. The offering cannot be separated from the offerer. He gave himself to us, listen, literally. Are you listening? He became a human being, flesh. And he became flesh for 20, 30 years? 33 years? The moment he became human, he became human forever. Do you see what I meant when I said he gave himself to us? He became, allow me to use the term, an earthly. One of us. He gave the offering that we could not, we can't give. There's an offering that we cannot give. The offering that expiates our sins. Christ was the expiatory offering, the lamb. And we could not give that offering. So God said, don't worry. You, 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 you cannot give me that. I'm not asking you to give me that offering. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to provide this offering for you. And when Abraham, Genesis 22, was walking with his son, the son says, Dad, where is the land? Remember? And what did Abraham say? God will provide the land. And then you go to to John chapter 1, verse 21, and John the Baptist is standing by, 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 by the, by the uh, river, and he said, there is the Lamb of God, the offering, the expiatory offering that we could not give. God provided it for us, the greatest philanthropist in the cosmos. Now let's go to let's go to offering offerings. But let me let me review the three things, okay? About God. The first one was speaks. He speaks. The second one? He's creator and owner. And the third one? Philanthropist. The greatest philanthropist in the universe. Now, offerings. Based on that, what can we say about the nature of an offering. The first thing I would suggest to you is a negative statement. Our offerings are not, are not intended to obtain forgiveness of sin. Are we together? You don't bring an offering to the Lord hoping that because this tithe or offering that you bring, he will forgive your sins. Why? Because the only offering that can forgive sins is the offering that he himself offered for us. So you don't bring an offering to the Lord in order to gain his sympathy or in order for, for him to love you a little more. No, he already loves you. Or to be gracious to you. He's already gracious to you. You see what I mean? So the first thing about offerings is that our offerings do not expiate sin. Number two. Our offerings make, make us look a little more 
like Jesus. You, you, you listening to me? See, when we give an offerings, we are imitating God because he is constantly given. So one of the ways that God has to reconstruct the image of God in us, one of the ways he has is offerings. I bring an offering. Why? Because God brought an offering. And when I do it, I'm behaving like him. So when you bring an offering, you have to say, today I look a little more like Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? When you put the offering in the plate, you can say, today I look a little more like Jesus. Praise the Lord. You see what I mean? Number three. When I give an offering, I'm saying, I'm saying, I belong to him. Because everything in the universe belongs to who? To him. But human beings became selfish. And they say, no, what I have is mine. It's mine. But when I bring the offering to the Lord, I say, Lord, Lord, I belong to you. Everything I have belongs to you. It helps us to overcome selfishness. An offering helps us overcome selfishness because we are acknowledging that everything we have belongs to him. Okay? Next one. Now, when you to listen to, to this, it's not complex, it's simple, but you have to listen to it. An offering is the embodiment of gratitude. I'm going to explain it. Gratitude is an emotion. Right? It's an emotion. Uh, we, we have this emotion inside us. And, and, and gratitude is, is an emotion that is is motivated by the reception of a good thing given to us, right? And, and, and this emotion is inside me. You don't see it. But you can perceive it, you know? If you, if you give me uh, something that I need it, uh, and, and, and it, 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 it impacts me, you know, I received this from you. And how did you know that I needed this? And, and I want to express gratitude. And how do we express gratitude? We express gratitude through words, words, right? We say, thank you. Thank you so much for this gift. See, the, the tone of the voice changes. We become soft. Because this gratitude is trying to express itself, to exteriorize itself. And, and even the eyes perhaps could become red, and even a tear may come down. Because we're so grateful for what you did. And sometimes we hold the hand of the person. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. See, this is the way we express emotion. And sometimes see that there are huggings, you know. Oh, thank you. Uh, so we express gratitude through words and actions. 
But the Bible goes beyond that. Beyond that. What if I can give you my gratitude in a box? See, my gratitude, when I express it to, through words and actions, you go and you take with you the memory of my expression of gratitude. You follow me? Just a memory. You go and you go home and you say, oh, my dear, in church this happened. This person was so grateful. You see, it's a memory that you take with you. But in the Bible, gratitude takes a form, an objective form. It becomes a concrete object that you can put in a box and give it to the person. Here is my gratitude. And you take it with you. And you're not taking just a memory. You're taking gratitude with you. My gratitude. And what is that gratitude that is so concrete? The offering. Are you following me? So when I give the offering, this $10 bill, which I'm going to put in the plate today together with my tithe. What is this, really? What is this? You said it's a $10 bill. What's a tricky question? What is this? Gratitude. I, I, I took this emotion that was inside me and the Lord said to me, you can, you can make it solid, visible through an offering. And when that happens, then my blessing is transferable. Am I okay? My blessing, my gratitude, my gratitude is transferable. I can give it to her, I can give it to him, or I give it to the Lord. Transferable. So when this offering goes into the plate. I have made visible and concrete my gratitude. And when this offering goes, let's say, to the mission field, what they receive there is what? An expression of my gratitude to the Lord. And that expression of gratitude to the Lord becomes out there a blessing for others. You see the cycle? It begins with a blessing. The Lord gave me this as a blessing. And I'm grateful. So I, I give it to him for the service of the church. And others receive my gratitude. And then it becomes a blessing for them. You see the power of this thing that we call offerings? Visible, tangible. We can transfer it and send it anywhere. And when we sit inside this church during the winter and we have this warm environment, you know what you're doing? You are benefiting from my gratitude to God. And I'm benefiting from your gratitude to God. Everything go back to him and his blessings. And it seems to me that it's important for us to really understand what is it what, that we're doing when we bring an offering. What is it that we do? Now my last, not my last, but for now, with respect to offerings, okay? 
What is an offering? We're going to review this in a minute. What is an offering? Apart from all we have said, there is one more thing. An offering is self-giving. It's my self-giving myself to the Lord. I told you that one of the theological elements in offerings is that God is the greatest philanthropist. Remember? In that he gave in his offering, he gave what? Himself. And when we give offerings, we become like him. So that my offering is an expression, a manifestation of my willingness to give myself to God today. Now, what is this? Gratitude. Gratitude. This is also, and that's what makes gratitude so important. This is also a fragment of my life. Are we together? This is a portion of my life, isn't it? I mean, I worked, I invested time and life in order to get this, and the Lord blessed me and gave me this. Now, I'm worthy, I hope, more than $10. I hope. I know old, old people, they think they, don't, you know, they are not worthy that much, but I, I am, and so are you. This is a token. When I place this on the offering plate, I'm saying to the Lord, this day I have given myself to you again. This is a token of my life. This is a token of what I am. Giving has to be voluntary. Yes, everything we have come from the Lord. He gave us everything. But and he wants us to give him back everything. There is one thing, there is one thing that he cannot take from us. He gave it to us and it's ours. One thing. You know, I, I don't have time to tell stories, but I wish I would. Um, you know, I, I wear this, this jacket. It's, it's mine. Well, the Lord gave it to me, really. There's a story behind it, too. But this can be gone in a moment. But there is something that the Lord gave me that is mine. Exclusively mine. It's this passage... In Proverbs 23, 26, my son, give me your heart. Give me what? Heart. Come on, talk to me. Heart. He cannot take it by force. You have to, what is the heart? In the Bible, the heart is the center of human, of the human will, the rational aspects of the human person. Will and rationality. 
And the Lord says, this is what makes you unique. This is you. So I want you. Give me your heart. If you don't give it to me, I cannot take it from you. So when you put this in the plate, or saying to the Lord, this is a token, a representation of my heart. I'm giving it back to you again. So next time you give an offering, think about it. Think about an offering as review. An offering, our offerings, have no atoning purpose. Number one. An offering makes me similar to God who gives. Hmm? Our offerings say that I belong to God. That he is my Lord. So when I place my offering in the plate, I'm telling the whole cosmos, you are my Lord. I belong to you. My offering is the embodiment of gratitude. Remember? Gratitude. And finally, my offering is an expression of my willingness to surrender myself to the Lord, to give to him my heart. Now, we have about 10 minutes. If you have questions or comments, they are welcome. No comments, no questions. Yes, Laura. We cannot outgive the Lord. Impossible. This is a good comment. You do not compete with the Lord. Who's going to give more? You can compete among yourself and you shouldn't do it. You know, who's going to give him more? You give him 10, I'm giving 20. You don't compete with the Lord. You humbly share. With him. I like to say tithes are returned because it's not ours, and the offerings are given. And offering is really the test of our selflessness or selfishness, whichever one applies. And um, if you just give, if you just return the tithe. I like to say you have not started to give. You have only given when you add an offering yeah. to the time. <coughs> That's true. You know, we show gratitude not when we give tithe, but when we give offerings. Now that bell, what does that mean? Five minutes. Yeah, five minutes. Okay. <coughs> yes. Loud because I'm old and I cannot not hear one. I can't hear either. So we're good. Um, many years ago, a family gave to Adventist Frontier Missions to missionaries in Mongolia. They gave every month. Years pass by. They're sitting in a potluck in a gymnasium in Arkansas. And in walks a young lady from Mongolia. Sits at the table across from them, just all coincidentally. Where are you from? From Mongolia. Oh, the only people I knew that were ever there were the Javas. Yes, they were my neighbors and they led me to Christ. Mm. This cycle of gratitude. Yeah. You rarely get to see the full circle, mm. but it's there. And she was there as an L.E. giving her gratitude. Sure. Sure. So this, this cycle of gratitude is very powerful. It's and really I powerful. appreciate it that you brought this out. I, I really haven't considered it before today, but it's it's a wonderful thing. Yes. The divine language you spoke of, would it have been spoken in Eden before the fall? Uh, 
the language we have is, is created language. The language that Adam and Eve spoke was created language. Divine language is not created. Right. Uh, I don't know what it is, and I don't want to speculate. <laughs> but uh, perhaps the good Lord may allow us to learn. I doubt it. Okay, okay. any other f- comments? Yes, please. I say that gratitude is something that God particularly appreciates. So when Jesus, you know, healed people and someone expressed their appreciation or, you know, one person comes back and shared their gratitude, he's like, this person gets it. And I really appreciate their expression of gratitude. So us, us sharing our gratitude back to God is something that he appreciates and treasures. Very, very much. In fact, you know, I haven't had time, but a, a significant amount of studies have been made by psychologists on the significance of gratitude. And it's a, it's a very powerful emotion that makes us happy, that enrich our lives and enrich the lives of the others. So God does love gratitude. Ellen G. White says one of the most common sins in the world is ingratitude. Now let me finish saying this. Offerings should be systematic. What do I mean by that? I mean, you don't give offerings because I come here and I say, uh, please, you know, put your hand in your pocket and whatever is there, give it to the Lord. Uh, no. You, 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 you organize your life. You decide at home how you're going to express gratitude on the Sabbath. You know, I, I, I know people who give a second tithe as offerings. Well, you know, praise the Lord. I, I don't have anything against that. I, you know, my wife and I, we decided a long time ago that we were going to give certain percentage as offerings. You see? It's systematic. It's not left to the emotional side of me when I come to church. It's something that I decided with the Lord. This is what I'm going to do. And sometimes we go beyond that. Because the Lord moves us to go beyond that, systematic. It's important to do it in a systematic way. But remember that the offering is gratitude and self-giving. When you put the envelope there, you're giving yourself to the Lord. Again, think about that when you do it. I'm telling the universe that I belong to him. He is my Lord. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the instruction that you have given us in the scriptures, for the privilege that you have given us to receive from you in order to give back to you. Help us to do it in a systematic way. Help us to do it conscious of what it means. And help us in every offering to give ourselves to you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath.